Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Your daily encouragement that God has the world in the hollow of his hand. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're going to fly, we fly like you. Can we have a feelings conversation? Oh, can we have a feelings conversation for just a moment? I know, I know, some of you don't like to talk about your feelings. Here's the good news. As you tell me how you're feeling, like, right, you you probably have an otherwise cone of silence. Like, right, so it's this is a safe place to share your feelings. How how are you feeling today? I'm Carmen LeBurge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. This is the Faith Radio Network. Feelings conversations are sometimes hard to have, but but we do need to get in touch with our feelings from time to time. And so let me ask you, how do you even start answering that question? Because the feelings conversation, how are you feeling today? Like, I don't know about you, if you've been, um, uh, if you've been, well, if even if you have been on your, like, uh, on your app that's helping your brain stay active, It starts with a question that has like this range of faces, goes from super sad or angry uh, all the way to like elated happiness emoji. And you are supposed to pick a face that represents how you feel today. That is hard to answer for me. I got to tell you, how are you feeling today is a hugely difficult question to answer because it's all about what you foreground in your thinking as you answer the feelings question, is this a head, shoulders, knees, and toes question? Is this a, do I have a headache? Do my shoulders and knees ache? Um, are my feet cramping? Uh, like, or is this a is this a feelings conversation in terms of like physicality? Um, is this a conversation related to how you feel psychologically? Like, how are you feeling today? If if a past trauma has pressed itself in on your heart and mind, then how you're feeling today may have much less to do uh, about your body and much more to do about your thinking, how you're feeling, your mood, psychological feeling. And then there is an entire spiritual perspective. How are you feeling like in terms of your soul and your outlook? Are you possessed of a peace that passes all understanding? Do you like recognize that circumstances are not what they necessarily appear to be if everything is held in not only an eternal but a perspective that is subject to the sovereignty and authority of God? Like, how are you answering the feelings question? Um. How are you feeling about the world and everything in it? That's a different that's a different feelings question than how are you feeling? <laughs> right? How are you feeling in relation to God and the reality that God's got you in the very palm of his hand? How do you feel about the reality that God is closer to you than your next breath? How do you feel about the reality that God speaks forgiveness over you? How do you feel about his mercies new every morning? How do you feel about the reality that at just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, subject to the realities um, of human life, subject to everything that you and I experience, God sent him to redeem us in order that we could be reconciled to him, in order that we could know God and be adopted as his very own children. How do you feel about that today? How are you feeling? The how 
in the how are you feeling question is worth pausing over as well. This is gets to this gets to the conversation that we have from time to time about what are you thinking about and then how are you thinking about what you're thinking about. So how are you feeling? Are you feeling what you're feeling as a person who is in Christ, abiding in Christ, with a life hidden in Christ, covered by Christ, walking with Christ, heading toward Christ, Christ at the center, before me, behind me, beside me to guide me? How are you feeling what you're feeling today? The feelings question is out there a lot. Hey, how you doing? How you feeling today? And you and I have the opportunity to foreground the reality of the gospel or foreground what I increasingly like to call the organ recital. How are you feeling today? Oh, well, you know, this this organ over here doesn't feel so good. And I got and my bones are achy and I you know, my stomach is uh, upset and, uh, you know, all, you know, the. <clears throat> or how are you feeling today? You know what? God is on the throne, not only of heaven eternal, but the throne of my heart. And so um, I'm possessed of a peace that passes all understanding. I'm not living under the circumstances. I'm living with a divine perspective in my life and your life and this world in which we live. Man, the world is a mess. It groans with eager longing for man's redemption. And that is who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. So I'm feeling pretty good. In fact, I'm feeling great. In fact, I am possessed of an unassailable joy. How are you feeling today? We're going to have a little checkup next with our friend, Dr. Jeff Barrows from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. I'm going to ask him how he expects people to answer when he asks them how they're feeling. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. The good doctor is here with us today, Dr. Jeff Barrows from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Carmen. Good to be with you. How how are you feeling this morning? And how do you expect people to answer that question when you ask them as a physician? Well, first of all, I'm thankful to be feeling uh, very much at peace, anticipating uh, Christmas coming in this Advent season. But as a physician, when I ask in my office, uh, in the exam room, how is someone feeling? I, I want them to answer, obviously, truthfully uh, and as completely as they can without hiding anything from us as the uh, healthcare professional. Yeah, I think um, truthful and accurate, those are really important. I will say that, like, you know, they say, look, on a, on a scale of one to 10, how much is this hurting? I I don't know. Like, I don't know. Who's, how do I measure that? I mean, that just seems so subjective. But yes, I, I understand the point of it. Based on my own personal uh, pain scale is how I'm answering that question. It just always seems um, so far from objectivity. You're exactly right. It's very subjective. And so the only way anybody can answer that question is according to their own scale, what they've experienced in the past. And I think a lot of women who have had children gone through the pain of labor would have that scale change a little bit uh, after that experience, no doubt. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. Um, Okay. It appears as if we are facing a virus smorgasbord this winter. The flu, COVID, RSV, something called white lung. What's going on out there? Well, I my personal opinion and looking a little bit online, uh, Carmen, is that the COVID pandemic has sensitized all of us to increases in respiratory infections. And we we are afraid that there's going to be a new virus coming out of China again. Uh, so we're more attuned to what's happening across the U.S. and across the world. 
But I'm I'm happy to say that there's no solid evidence at this time that there's this unique infection uh, that is people are talking about. And in terms of this white lung, uh, I, I, I kind of find that a little bit humorous because when you look at a chest X-ray, any pneumonia looks white. Uh, you can have it white on one side or bilateral. Uh, so there really medically is no unique infection that would cause a white pneumonia, any pneumonia that that causes infection in the lungs itself will look white on the chest x-ray. So you're right, we've got these infections. Uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, is a little bit more common than it's been in the past. We've got flu, we've got adenoviruses, rhinoviruses that are coming out. There's still a little bit of COVID floating around. So I think it's just back to some of the basics in terms of recommendations. Uh, I, I do recommend that people that qualify, uh, which is most everybody, get the flu vaccine. I, I've got mine a couple of months ago. If you are uh, immunocompromised uh, for whatever reason, uh, RSV is a good uh, vaccine to get as well. Unfortunately, there's some places of shortage around the country, so you might be limited to your ability to get it. But I think lastly, we, we need to use common sense as well. If we are sick or one of our family members is sick, stay home. Don't send a child out to daycare when, when they just start a cough or they're sneezing all over everybody. Uh, they're not going to do a good job of being uh, hygiene minded. So my recommendation is keep them home. Uh, but we, you know, we don't want to go back to the lockdowns. But I think there are some basic common sense measures that we can take to keep spreading our germs to others, especially in our family. Let's talk about um, substance abuse. Let's talk about substance abuse among young people. Um, I don't think it's going to surprise any of us that, you know, kids who are, let's say, taking prescription drugs that are not prescribed to them are also co-ingesting alcohol alongside that. Um, let's talk about that. Let's also talk about how religious engagement um, might help prevent substance abuse. Yeah, it's this is a to me an encouraging study, and and I've raised three children myself uh, along with my wife, and I know that as uh, parenting young adolescents, you want to do whatever you can to keep them from getting caught up into the whole drug and alcohol issue. And, uh, you know, at that time, we hoped that church involvement would lessen the risk, and, but there was no proof of this. But this is a, a very encouraging study that does provide some proof that religiosity is related to a decrease in involvement with drugs and alcohol. And it's a study out of the University of Central Florida they took data from the U.S. National Survey uh, looking at various, thing, uh, various issues between 2015 and 2019, contained over 57,000 young people. And they kind of dove down into the data looking specifically at prescription drug misuse and alcohol co-ingestion, as you mentioned, over the previous 30 days of when the, uh, when the survey was undertaken in those years. And what they found was that those that had expressed that religiosity was important to them, their religious beliefs, that they actually made decisions on the basis of religious beliefs and had regular attendance at religious meetings, they had an 18% lower risk for any prescription drug use and co-ingestion with alcohol and 28% lower risk for opioid ingestion. So very encouraging. The study is a great study because it's large. It covers multiple years. They did a great job at controlling for uh, co-variables and really so we can finally say that there actually is proof that getting young people involved in church and religious activities will decrease their risk of being exposed to prescription drug and alcohol use. That's so good. That's such good news. We're going to um, continue our conversation with doc Dr. Jeff Barrows here in just a moment. We have um, We have highlighted the fact that the U.S. suicide rate reached a new record high. We're going to touch on that subject and 
as soon as we surface this conversation, we want to be quick to remind you um, of the National Suicide Hotline, which is just 988. Um, So if you or someone that you know or love needs to have a conversation right now or today um, about suicidal thoughts or ideation, um, 988 is open all the time. Um, And so we want to be sure that we make you aware of that. We'll continue this conversation with Dr. Jeff Barrows in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. You've heard it said that it only takes a spark to get a fire going. You've also heard it sung, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Well, what about hope? What about hope? What does it take to get hope sparked? And what does it take to get hope moving uh, around the world? I got a hope hat. I got a hope shirt. I got a hope bumper sticker. I know a ministry of hope. I know people who need hope. But how do we actually give hope beyond bumper stickers and theme songs and ball caps? How do we help other people discover the hope that is real, substantial, and enduring? My guess is one reason you listen to this podcast is, well, it delivers hope. So as you're thinking about giving gifts this Christmas, have you considered giving others the gift of hope? You can give hope this season by supporting Faith Radio's Give Hope for Christmas campaign by sharing your story of hope at MyFaithRadio.com because hope begets hope. Pass it on. If you or someone that you know is in need of hope, um, we want to encourage you to text the word HOPE to 877-933-2484. We we don't want you to be out there feeling disconnected or alone. And so let us encourage you and pray with you. Just text the word HOPE to 877-933-2484. We're going to talk about a sensitive topic. Um, It's a topic of deep concern And it is the subject of suicide, the taking of one's own life. The National Center for Health Statistics recorded nearly 50,000 suicides last year. That is um, an increase of 2.6% from the prior year, um, and it is the highest since 1941. Dr. Jeff Barrows is here with us from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. Jeff, um, how do you account for this? Um, what do you what do you say in in the face of this increase in suicides? Well, as you have alluded to, this is a heartbreaking statistic, and uh, just to recognize that more Americans committed suicide in 2022 than any other year on record is is an amazing and tragic statement. And we as Christians recognize the value of life since we we believe we're created in the image of god so each individual case of suicide is is heartrending and as you mentioned there were 50,000 and this is at the end of the pandemic we can't blame this statistic on covid and to me initially what was surprising is that the highest group uh, within this 50,000 were men 75 and older and they were no doubt suffering from loneliness and bereavement. Women aged 55 to 64 uh, was the highest age group. And they found that women were more likely to have suicidal thoughts than men, but men were more likely to carry it out. And I know that, that not while it's, first of all, tragic and, and heartrending, it, it's, it's, there are many, many causes to it. And I just can't help but wonder that one of the contributors is the impact of the increased emphasis we have in our society and culture on individualism and personal autonomy. This has been increasing over the past several decades. You know, in essence, it says, I will make decisions for myself. I will not subject myself to anyone else or any authority, especially to any religion. And while there are many reasons, I can't help but but think that this is part of the reason for the increase in the divorce rate in our country, estrangement from family and friends, loss of engagement with others. And what happens when those things kind of combine together? You end up being alone at the end of your life. And this is exactly the opposite of what we're taught in the Christian faith. And as Christians, we're taught to submit ourselves to the Lord and to each other 
to our spouses, to family members, and we are taught to see ourselves as part of something larger and greater, which is one of the reasons the suicide rate in Christians is less than in the general population. So unfortunately, I see this as yet another tragic symptom that's resulting from our society and culture moving away from God and placing ourselves in the role of God in our own lives. And and this is truly tragic. It was interesting um, that just five days ago, Canada, their 988 hotline came online. Um, and I'll just go ahead and confess to you, that's a little confusing because in Canada, um, they're also like openly advocating that people make use of um medical aid and dying. I mean, they have a they have a whole made system and they've a lot of folks accessing that. Um, it, so can you talk a little bit about maybe just the confusion that exists around the topic of life and death? Yeah, you, you're not alone in being confused in this. I think there are a lot of a lot of people, including some of the government officials are unsure what to do up in Canada. And right now, the, the act of euthanasia is legal in Canada. So the difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia is assisted suicide is when a healthcare professional gives medication to the patient that will kill them, and then the patient takes that medicine. Euthanasia is when the healthcare professional administers the drugs to the patient. And euthanasia, not only is it legal in Canada now, but they are now opening it up this coming spring to those that have a, uh, a mental health disorder, including depression. So on the one hand, they're telling patients that have depression and suicidal thoughts, well, here, you can go ahead and be euthanized. And on the other hand, they're, they've created this hotline. And so there's clear confusion. And I'm, I'm interested to see how it will work its way out. But the other thing that I would just add is that this may well be coming to us here in the United States. And we've already got assisted suicide legal in 11 jurisdictions, 10 states plus the uh, District of Columbia, so it's 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 coming. There are lots of people that are trying to get it legal in more states, and we just need to fight this off as Christians and recognize that we don't have the ability to take our own life when we want to do that. Yeah, the Lord the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Um, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I, I the reality that we are subject um, to God, whether we acknowledge it or not. Um, is a part, I think, of the larger conversation that we as Christians need to have. And I know people who profess to be Christians who are interested in controlling this aspect of the end of their life. Um, And so this is a conversation that pastors need to learn to have. It's a conversation that, you know, we need to be having in women's ministries and, um, and men's small groups. Like, this is a conversation we've got to be having um, because older adults in the United States of America are increasingly alone at the end of life. And so as Christians, we we got to make sure that people are knit into the fabric of Christian communities. And that means the local church needs to be on the forefront of this conversation. I fully agree. And the other point we need to make is that a lot of people are choosing this made because they think they're going to suffer and they can limit their suffering. They need to understand that medicine and the ability of medicine to deal with that suffering has made tremendous advances, especially over the last one to two decades. So that's not a reason to choose made. Um, most people, in fact, end up choosing it because their family members will want them to. But you don't need to worry about suffering there's good medical care and and pain medications that can deal with that and help help you have a, an easy transition into natural death. Jeff, um, we don't have time today to unpack this entire conversation about you know when doctors play God, but can you just maybe brief us in on on the fact that this conversation is taking place? Yeah, there's a tragic story out of the UK, and uh, briefly, there is uh, there was a girl born by the name of Indy Gregory earlier this year. Uh, she ended up being diagnosed with a very rare degenerative mitochondrial disease. Uh, just, it's very similar to ALS, uh, except it can be a lot more severe. 
And so she'd had several interventions and even surgeries. And at six months of age, the National Health Service doctors in the UK recommended that she be allowed to die. And the parents, of course, disagreed. They filed a lawsuit. The judge agreed, unfortunately, with the doctors. But this was complicated by the fact that the Italian government stepped in and said, we'll give her citizenship, Italian citizenship, and pay for all of her medical expenses. And a children's hospital in Rome offered to take her, but the judge still would not allow it to happen. So tragically, baby Indy died on November 13th. And this was just, as you said, an example of judges and doctors playing God as to when a baby should die rather than looking for every way possible to prolong her life. So this is one of those where, see, I'm going to take issue. I, I'm pro-life from conception to natural death. And so I, I don't necessarily believe that every medical intervention that is possible is necessarily, um, like, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, and so I, I mean, I, I, I know that I might sound... Um, non-empathetic on this point. Um, but, you know, death is not the worst reality. I mean, if I'm a Christian, then I believe that, you know, there, that death is not the final, does not have the final say in a person's life. Um, so I would say this is a conversation, an ethical conversation that I as a Christian could engage in um, from more than one perspective. You're exactly right. And what you're discussing, Carmen, is what we call medical futility. And in fact, we're, we're revamping our ethical statement at CMDA on that. And you're exactly right. There are situations where any further medical intervention is futile and natural death should be allowed to happen. I don't know that we were at that point with this young baby. Uh, I don't know mm. enough about the, the medical uh, exact information of what was going on. And especially with a young person, you, you want to give the benefit to allowing some of these treatments to take place for a period of time versus somebody at the end of their life where it's a little bit more clear that a, an intervention is simply going to be futile. It will not really prolong their life in any any meaningful way. So there is that reality. Reality, and we need as Christians to recognize, yes, we are we are destined for death at some point and hopefully into, into eternal life with the Lord. Mm, that's that's very helpful. Jeff, as always, thank you so much for the conversation and for helping us think think through these um, very important issues um, in, in life. My pleasure to be with you again, Carmen. Great, great, great to you. see you. Likewise. That's Dr. Jeff Barrows. He's with the Christian Medical and Dental Association, cmda.org, for all kinds of great resources. Their position papers, I find, particularly helpful in the conversations that we're seeking to have today. Um, all right. So one of the things that um, that Luke mentioned is that all of the all of the annual events in the little town of Bethlehem, all of the events in Manger Square have been canceled this year. Um, Bethlehem is in the West Bank and um, not a safe place for Christians to be expressing their faith during this particular Advent and Christmas season. And so let me advocate this. You can take a virtual tour of Bethlehem. You can take a virtual tour of the Holy Land. Um, there are all kinds of options online for Advent pilgrimages um, to, you know, to fulfill that desire and to take you into the places and spaces where, you know, we read about them in the Bible. And so you can now visit them virtually, which I think is a great gift. How not to ruin Christmas. Have you had a ruined Christmas? <sighs> Don't miss the miracle of God's greatest gift in all of the midst of, um, well, the cacophony of consumerism and other things. So we're going to talk with Dan Metzger next. He's an author and a pastor. We're going to talk about how not to ruin Christmas. That's up next on Mornings with Carmen. Hey, joining us now, Dan Metzger. How not to ruin Christmas. Don't miss the miracle of God's greatest gift. Dan, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is fun. So let me let me frame um, 
frame it this way. Tragic things happen. Terrible things happen. People don't celebrate Christmas because of this or that or the other thing, um, because of a loss that they revisit in ways that are not helpful during the Christmas season. So we we want to expect the right things during the season, um, but oftentimes we draw ourselves into expecting the worst of things. So how do we ruin Christmas? And then let's talk about how not to. Yeah, if you want to ruin Christmas, it's really easy to do. You can just get caught up in all of the uh, worries that come along with all of the list making and all of the uh, different things you have to do and the expectations that maybe other people have of you. Um, you can uh, you can give in to all of the conflict that comes from the family get-togethers. I, I'm sure we've all had uh, experiences like that where um, you're maybe not exactly looking forward to going to some of your family get-togethers because you know that certain conversations are going to happen and somebody's going to want to talk politics at the table or uh, or there's going to be other just things that uh, a myriad of things that can uh, really kind of cause some of that tension to to rise up. And uh, it's it's very easy for us, I think, to kind of uh, lean into some of the dread that we feel uh, when it comes to Christmas, because we know that every the expectations are so high uh, for us to have a great Christmas, for, for us to have a, a perfect Christmas, a Hallmark movie Christmas, um, <laughs> that it can be, um, you know, it, it can, it, it can be overwhelming for us. And so, uh, you know, it's easy to let all of that kind of kind of pile on. And uh, and I expect that that happens for a lot of people. You know, I talk about how um, when you get into October and you already start seeing the candy canes pop up on the store shelves, your chest starts to get a little bit tight sometimes uh, when you uh, when you realize that Christmas is coming. This idea that we um, might have expectations of Christmas that are very culturally captive like very, Mm -hmm. very culturally captive. You got me thinking that instead of desiring to have a Hallmark-worthy Christmas or Hallmark movie-worthy Christmas, I really want to have a first-century Bethlehem-worthy Christmas. In some, yeah. Like, like, right, I really want to have, yeah, I want to, I want to have an expectation of Christmas that actually gets me to the manger throne. Yeah, I, I think in in some ways you're absolutely right that we want those uh, we we really want that um, that Jesus centric Christmas. I, a part of the reality though is that first the very first Christmas wasn't wasn't that great for in some ways for uh, for no, people. No, it was there dirty. Was, was and no, of, no, yeah, no, yeah. that's exactly right. It was like painful and dirty and inconvenient yeah. and. And not a lot of resources and and maybe, you know, maybe questions related to hospitality and of the stranger. I mean, like on and on and on. There's all kinds. Uh, well, maybe then I want to have a Christmas that's worthy of the expectation of the wise men who had been waiting and watching in the East for centuries. <laughs> I, I think that that's I think that that's the key. The key is what are what does this child in the manger mean? Um, it, it, the child in the major means that hope has come into the world, mm-hmm. that the Prince of Peace is ultimately here, uh, that, you know, Mary began to sing when she uh, encountered Elizabeth and Elizabeth uh, helped her to have the faith that that everything that was being born in her, it was really true. And Mary started singing about kings being brought down off their thrones and and the poor being uh, being lifted up and the hungry being filled with good things. She started singing about these things before they had even actually happened because her faith in in who this child would be and who Jesus would be was so strong that it was a foregone conclusion. Uh, And so Christmas really helps us, I think, to celebrate um, in the midst of the darkness that light is going to win the day, that that. Um, that good is going to win over evil, that God ultimately does does triumph. And, and so it's if we're circumstantial at, around Christmas, if we look just at our present circumstances, it can be very easy to 
fall into into traps of oh man things aren't going well you know christmas is ruined but when we when we come to understand that because of jesus the worst thing is never the last thing mm-hmm. it changes our whole perspective of what the season can be the worst thing is never the last thing that's that's a that's that's quotable. I'm done writing that down right now. We're talking <laughs> with Dan Metzger. He's a pastor. He's also the author of How Not to Ruin Christmas. Dan, you walk through um, maybe the the four words that many of us who attend churches that light Advent candles, like right, we think about these words all the time. We have these words in front of us: hope, peace, joy, and love. Um, hope has come, like. He arrived in a, in a person wrapped in human flesh. It's amazing. The, the Prince of Peace has arrived. You you have you feature this you know the singing of Mary. Talk talk with us about hope, peace, joy, and love. Just, just pick one of them and unpack it a little bit from how not to ruin Christmas. Well, I'll start with the idea of hope, and there's hope is you know one of the things that the, the prophets talked about that. Uh, that Mary first, I think, realized um, maybe when she uh, had her encounter with with Elizabeth. Um, and the the opposite of hope is worry, is that things are going to be bad in the future, and or that things are going to be uh, going to be harder. Um, and so, one of the things that that I talk about is that there's a tipping point where you go either to worry or to hope. And the tipping point is faith. It's where your your faith is. Is do you believe? Do you really believe that that God uh, does win the day? And um, and so when we have hope, when we have hope that that um, that God does really does really win the day, it changes it changes a lot. I remember in 2020 um, when we had uh, uh, the you know, the COVID Christmas Eve, uh, that was a, a really hard time for a lot of people in the country. And and I found myself sick during that time. It was the first, um, it was the first Christmas Eve in many years that I wasn't able to be in church lighting candles and singing Silent Night with our, with our congregation. And it was, it was devastating. And it was, it was beginning to feel like, is this ever going to end? And mm-hmm. Um, towards uh, one of the things that we did because we knew we couldn't get together was we put together a video to send out to uh, to our congregation. And at the end of the video, it was our worship leader singing Silent Night in an empty uh, sanctuary while pictures of our congregation in their homes uh, holding their candles in front of their Christmas trees or sitting on their couches together with their family, just these pictures began to scroll through. And I found myself tearing up. Um, and the last, uh, the last frame was the words from the Gospel of John that tell us that a light has come into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And it couldn't overcome it. Uh, the darkness couldn't overcome light in 2020, and the darkness doesn't overcome the light today. And so we have hope. We have hope that even in the midst of the darkest nights, that there is good yet to come. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue our conversation with Dan Metzger here in just a moment. The book is How Not to Ruin Christmas. If you're thinking right now about somebody who needs some hope, this Christmas. Don't forget, we are giving hope for Christmas right now at MyFaithRadio.com. You can nominate somebody um, who needs some encouragement during this Christmas season. So check that out. Um, Ask God to lay a particular individual on your heart who needs to be blessed this Christmas. Faith Radio would love to be a part of that. So visit us at MyFaithRadio.com and check out how to give hope for Christmas. We're going to continue our conversation with Pastor Don, Dan Metzger here in just a moment. The book is How Not to Ruin Christmas. As we consider the life of Jesus and the life of the first generation of Christians, reading here the book of Acts and all the letters to the Christians in the New Testament, we see people who like wake up, they come to see and understand and then receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And it changes everything. We see Christians then telling other people about the good news and inviting them 
to respond in repentance, be baptized, and follow Jesus. The movement of Christianity grows person by person and then exponentially as people walking in darkness receive the light of Christ and want others to know what they know and have what they have. Well, you and I are living in dark days. People need light. And Jesus is the light of the world today in the same way that he was the light of the world at the beginning of creation and at the first Christmas and throughout his life on earth and in his radiance now at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the light of the world. So if you're walking in darkness of any kind today, I invite you to consider Jesus. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. What are you expecting this Christmas? Are you expecting this to be the greatest Christmas ever? Um, If so, what does that mean? (laughs) What would that even look like? Um, We uh, we certainly have expectations related to Christmas. Some of them are cultural. Some of them are totally unrealistic. And some of them are based in the reality of who comes at Christmas, what Christmas is really all about, the reality of of the miracle of the greatest gift ever, and that is the person of Jesus. The book is How Not to Ruin Christmas. Dan Metzger is here sharing it with us today. Um, Dan, let's um, let's jump ahead a little and let's talk about re-gifting. Why, um, <laughs> why, why re-gifting? So a part of what inspired me to kind of think about this uh, book and and write this book is as a pastor, every year I'm trying to come up with a different way to tell the story, (laughs) to tell the story of Christmas and, uh, and, and to talk about, you know, the child born in the manger and hope, peace, joy, and love. And it kind of dawned on me that we don't need to come up with something fancy and, and brand new. We get the same gift from God every year. It's mm-hmm. uh, it, he gives us the greatest re-gift of all time. And, um, you know, we can sometimes kind of look down on, on re-gifting. I, we have the re-gift box in our, in our closet that we give to people, you know, the, the candle that somebody gave us last year, we're giving to somebody else this year. And we can kind of <laughs> look down on the idea of re-gifting. Have to but keep, God gives so here's, us- so here's my re-gifting. I definitely have a re-gifting strategy. Um, and I, here's one of the things I have learned over time. And I learned this from my sister who made the ultimate re-gifting mistake, which was to give last year's gift back to the person who gave it because she didn't, she wasn't keeping track. And so you have to keep the card with the gift until you give it again. That's a great there you strategy. Go. Yeah, it's it's totally important, especially for a pastor. I feel like this is essential because, I mean, you know, right, you can only have so many Bibles and creches and Noah's Arks and ways that they've reduced the scriptures uh, onto the grain of sand. Like, right, you can be strategic (laughs) about how you give those gifts again. (laughs) That's that's a great point. That's a great point. So God, God though gives has the best regift box, and and God gives us the same thing every year. God gives us his presence. He gives us Emmanuel, God with us. And it's it's the thing that we need every year. And it's the thing that we need to be reminded of every year. And um and, and so it's it's really God's presence that gives us all of these things that we need. We we have hope because God is with us in Jesus. Um, you know, we've seen God move mountains in the past and we know that he can do it again. And we have peace because God is with us in Jesus, right? He's the Prince of Peace. And he he comes and tells his disciples in the upper room, you know, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give you to you as the world gives. And we have joy because God is with us in Jesus. And there's a joy, I think, that just comes from uh, being just close to God and knowing that knowing that that God is is near. And we have love because God is with us in Jesus. So all of these things, um, all of these things we find in this re-gift, this thing that he re-gifts to us every single year. And uh, it's the greatest re-gift of all. That's fantastic. Talk with us um, a little bit about singing. 
Um, I love the observation related to Mary. I also um, love the story that you remind us of um, in terms of um, the the bells. Uh, I heard the yeah. bells on Christmas Day. You do a beautiful job retelling that story. Um, talk with us about about singing and um, and its relationship to to joy and even in the midst of sorrow. There, there's something about the Christmas, uh, the Christmas songs that um, just really, uh, I think, have some some beautiful, uh, beautiful phrases in them and beautiful stories behind them that really help us to experience the the joy of Christmas. Um, yeah, I talk about uh, how Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in uh, the 1860s. Um, he is 1863. He woke up on Christmas morning and he could hear church bells ringing. And uh, it was a Christmas that could easily have been the worst Christmas, um, the worst Christmas of his life. And he uh, he had just two years earlier lost his wife, Fanny, in a tragic fire. Um, his son had been off fighting in the Union Army in the American Civil War. And um, on the first day of December, he had gotten a telegram that Charlie had been shot during the Battle of Mine Run and uh, was was alive, but was uh, uh, kind of clinging to life. And so the Civil War is raging. He's this widowed father of, of six children. His oldest is is off fighting in a bloody war and he hears Christmas bells ringing. And so he begins to write down the words that I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And he says in there, in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks a song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And he could have stopped right there, but he doesn't. He goes on and continues to write and says, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. And there's something about the, the bells during um, uh, on Christmas Day, even in the midst of his hardest moment, in the midst of his darkest circumstances, uh, that reminded him that God wins the day, that, um, that God is with us, even in the midst of war, even in the midst of tragedy. It's no mistake that we celebrate celebrate Christmas during the darkest days of the year when when it seems like things are are the at their worst. And we celebrate knowing that light is overtaking darkness. And so there's things there's parts of that music, uh, especially his song. Um, I heard the bells on Christmas Day that I really think just point us right towards the true joy of Christmas. Dan, what a gift. Thank you so much for re-gifting us this year with the gift, uh, the greatest gift, the gift of Jesus. The book is How Not to Ruin Christmas. Um, Christmas is going to fall on one of the longest and darkest days of the year. It's going to be dark on Christmas. It's going to be dark in ways not only physical, but it's going to be dark in terms of the events um, unfolding in human history. And into that darkness, light is born. The light of the world is going to penetrate the darkness. And he is going to take up residence among us to be the very light of life, the love of God wrapped in human flesh, re-gifted in a box we call a manger. Hey, one of you um, texted me that we need to be praying today for the people of India Um, under horrific floods related um, to a powerful storm sweeping through that part of the world. So let's be mindful that God's got the whole world in his hands. He has deep concern for each and every precious person. So let's tune up our prayers today um, for this world that um, God would not only have it in the hollow of his hand, but that people would recognize that God is closer to each of us than our very next breath. Have a great day. And God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBerge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. 
If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.